I'm going to spend quite some time on stories on the brain because I think that's the exciting stuff. But where the, the what is it, where the rubber hits the road, that's when we bring it into the classroom. So I'm hoping that as I'm going over some of the principles, you'll also be thinking about how you are using stories in the classroom or how you might use stories in the classroom if you happen to be convinced by some of the things that, that I'll be sharing with you this evening. Kudos to everybody for turning out at this time on a Friday evening. I'm exhausted. I imagine most of you are too, so I, I'd like to get started if that's okay. Um, it was 1987. It was 1987 and Kobe Chalt had what they then called a mini conference on large classes. One of the speakers, and I have no idea who it was, one of the plenary speakers, well, there were about 25 of us at this mini conference, so plenary is an exaggeration, but one of the speakers told us about Professor Richard Allwright, Dick to his friends. Dick Allwright, a few years before that, had convened at Lancaster University in the UK, a conference devoted entirely to large classes. And what they found out of that conference was that whether the, the teachers had 600 students or six students, they all thought their classes were too large. I remember nothing about that conference except this one story. It's 35 years ago, I have to be <laughs> allowed to forget a lot of it, but isn't it significant that I remembered the story? Stories are very powerful tools for learning. And what I would like to share with you this evening is some of the recent thinking, especially coming out of brain sciences, about just what it is about stories that play to the strengths of the human brain. And not coincidentally, those strengths are also the most important factors in human survival. So we're talking about some really basic mechanisms and stories play into them. And if we as language teachers can just harness some of the power of stories, we're doing ourselves and our students quite a favor. There are three groups of ideas that I'd like to share with you. The first is around stories and emotions. And as you see, the other one is about shared experiences and then something about stories and patterns. And then I hope we'll have a chance to share some ideas among ourselves about the how of, use, of using stories and storytelling in the classroom after I've had a chance to go over these three reasons about the why of using stories in the classroom. Stories and emotions. Stories evoke emotion. Good stories evoke a whole range of emotions one after another. In fact, when I was looking, sort of Googling around on the idea of stories and emotion, I found this wonderful graph which shows the relative amount of happiness for each percentage of the, the last of the Harry Potter books that you read and how things go up and down. And I apologize if anybody doesn't know how Harry Potter ends, but there you are. That's the emotional journey that J.K. Rowling takes us on when we read Harry Potter. A good storyteller is always working on our emotions. And I'm not really saying anything. I'm not really saying anything new there, but just think about the classrooms that we work in. Unless you're teaching kindergarten, it seems to me that the classrooms that we have are more or less drained of emotion. They are as neutral as possible. Even the way they paint the walls in hospitals conveys more emotion than the classrooms that I teach in. So even if, even if you only hear one thing from me tonight, its stories are really good because they take the student out of the classroom and place them in a much more emotionally charged world. But that's not all, because if there was no emotion, if, we re if our lessons were as barren of emotion as the classrooms were asked to teach in, there could be no learning. Emotion is essential to learning. And actually, that's not something that Mr. Spock said. It's something that Mary Helen Imadino Yang, I practiced all day to say her name in one breath, something that Mary Helen discovered when she began to look very deeply into emotions, learning, and the brain. Why would it be that there's no learning without, I mean, we all know that if, if something is connected with strong emotion, strong emotion, we tend to rem remember it. But why would it be that there's no learning without emotion? Well, 
there are certain things we have to learn in life. Don't put your hand in the fire. If you have someone who loves you enough to hold you close, that's a relationship to hold on to. That there are some things in life that are going to make you cry and some things that are going to make you sad. Emotion tags these experiences. Emotion makes sure that you remember things. You remember things connected with emotion because emotion is a tag that the brain places on certain experiences to make sure that you don't forget them. And that's learning. Not forgetting things is a large part of learning. So without, without emotion, there is no learning. Of course, what I'm saying is not new. Here's a story from, they reckon about 200,000 years ago. This was certainly something that somebody wanted to communicate and to have remembered. There's emotion in there if you want to look for it. There's all kinds of things in there if you want to look at it. But this connection between stories and remembering is something that we've known about for quite a long time. I just, th just think of the fairy tales that you grew up with, the fairy tales you maybe you told your own children as they grew up. They encode important messages don't go into the woods alone. Just because she looks like your grandmother doesn't mean it's okay to get close to her because she might be a wolf in grandmother's clothing and so on. The messages are encoded in the stories because the stories evoke emotion and they're remembered and so the messages are passed on. In fact, and I found this really fascinating, in the 1950s they started to get seriously worried about what to do with nuclear waste. This stuff is really, really toxic, and it's going to be toxic for not hundreds of years, but thousands and tens of thousands of years. So the question was, how do we make sure that even 5,000 years from now, nobody goes and digs a hole in what is now a nuclear waste dump? And they actually got some intelligent people from all kinds of different fields to, to, to share ideas on this. And the answer they came up with was, we need to encode the knowledge of the danger in stories. And we need to set up a storytelling priesthood that will tell people thousands of years from now in languages that don't yet exist that there are certain places where you don't go dig a hole because there's stuff in there that is in some way dangerous. In fact, it's radioactive and it would probably kill you in the end. They found they, The reason they suggested this was because they looked for knowledge that had endured for thousands of years. They found fables, they found parables, they found stories that encode knowledge, that evoke emotion and use that emotional tag to make sure that people remember them. Without emotion, there can be no learning. And as I say, our classrooms can be pretty barren places if we just let them be the classrooms that we're given. So I've talked a little about stories and emotion and how certainly emotion, memory and stories seem to fit together as a set. Let me move on to, to talking about emotions and, and shared experience. A lovely quote, lovely quote from a lovely lady, actually. When we listen to another's story, we are no longer strangers. That was something that I picked up in a, a video I watched of this lady whose name is Deepa Kiran. She is a professional storyteller in India. She travels the country telling stories and getting paid for it. Nice job if anybody's interested. And um, this, is, this is why she does it. When we listen to another story, we're no longer strangers. As language teachers, I think there are two important things in that very short quote from Deepa. The first one has to do with community. We are no longer strangers to each other. If we learn something together with other people, if we learn something from other people, if we learn something for other people, now you can do one without the other. That's why I've gone through the together with, the from and the for. They're not necessarily the things that go together. Any of those things will make the learning better. How do I know that? Because I'm a disciple of Dr. Matthew Lieberman, whose book Social I think should be on every teacher's reading list. 
Yeah, why our brains are wired to connect. And when he says connect, he's, he's punning because he actually means connect with other people. And his research has shown that there are two part, two different patterns in the brain when people are learning. He's labeled them the analytic network and the social network. And the analytic network is the parts of the brain that are operating when the teacher says, go learn this, there'll be a test tomorrow. What? And how often have we done that this week? Well, go learn this, there'll be a test tomorrow, a test next week, and so on. The social areas, which as you see, are totally different from the analytic areas. Those are the areas that happen when we learn something from somebody, when we learn something with somebody, or when we learn something for somebody. The good news is that the social networks seem to result in longer lasting, better quality learning than the analytic networks. We all knew that go learn this for the test was not a great way to motivate our students and result in quality, to, quality learning. But here we have Matthew Lieberman's research telling us that if we can engage the social, what he calls the social brain in learning, then we have multiplied the power of the learning that's happening in that classroom. Um, for example, he, um, he gave students lists of words to learn. To one group of students, he said, go learn that, there will be a test tomorrow. Quite literally, he said that. And he said to the other group, go learn that, I will ask you to teach it to some younger students tomorrow. The next day, there were no younger students to teach, so all the students took the same test, and the ones who were learning for other people were the ones who did better on the test. That's just one example of the power of social learning. Unfortunately, you can't have them both at the same time. He's a great one for coining ideas, the neural seesaw, he calls it. Basically, it means you either have the analytic circuit switched on or you have the social circuit switched on, but you're not going to have them both switched on at the same time. So. Let's be careful in the classroom that we are helping students to learn from each other. How do we switch on the social brain after the students perhaps come to school expecting that they'll be asked to work analytically? Well, pair work, group work, learning with other people, learning from other people, learning for other people. Learn this because I'd like you to teach it to some other students, that kind of thing. Also, something that I, I always forget until I get to the classroom, if I want to give the students a piece of paper with some rep, something written on it, I always make enough papers for all the students in the class, and then I remember. It's much more powerful if I only give out half of the papers. It's much more powerful if you've got two students pouring over the same paper, helping each other to learn from it or to get the message. That's all about switching on the social brain. And remember, when we listen to another story, we are no longer strangers. So stories bring us together as a community. We are learning together if we're learning from and through stories. But I think there's another message in there for language teachers as well. And that's not so much sharing community, it's about sharing meanings. From quite an early age, I was told that there were things in some languages that could not possibly be translated into another language. Uh, giri seems to be one of the examples that people talk about in Japanese and possibly shibui, the taste shibui as well. Uh, another one that was often given as an example was schadenfreude. In fact, the English word for schadenfreude is schadenfreude because it's assumed to be untranslatable from German. I mean, to a language teacher, it doesn't sit well that something is untranslatable. And, and, and then there was borscht. I've spent some time with um, colleagues in the Russian Far East through Jout's partner in the Russian Far East in Vladivostok, Filter. And many of the, the ladies of Filter were happy to invite me to their homes and share with me their homemade borscht from their mother's recipe. And I tasted it and said, yeah, that's very tasty. Thank you very much. Wrong reaction. Stephen, they said, you will never understand what meaning it has for a Russian person to taste their mother's recipe of borscht. It is not possible for you to understand the associations evoked by the experience of eating borscht. Untranslatable experience. Except, except, except. There are stories. And the stories really do help us to share meaning. 
I'm not sure it's part of the original series of Mr. Men, but there really is a Mr. Schadenfreude with all the pages devoted to helping you to understand this concept. And if I've understood correctly, the master and Margarita does a wonderful job at helping you to understand the experience of eating somebody's mother's borscht recipe. Stories can help us to experience other people's meanings. And this is not trivial. This is not a small point that applies just on those esoteric edges of, of life as, the, as, as it is lived in different countries, different situations. This is fundamental to what we mean when we use words. And as language teachers, we really have to be interested in that. Dog, what could be simpler? I say dog, you think of a dog. Yeah, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one correspondence between the dog, the word dog and the animal dog, except there's more than one kind of dog. And not everybody will have experienced all of the different kinds of dogs, or even that dog. There's more than one kind of dog, and there's more than one way of representing dogness in the brain. You may, if you are naive, think that dog is represented in your brain by some kind of stereotypical representation of a dog. Not at all. The woof of the dog is represented in one place, the movement of the dog in another place, the color in another place, the tactile, what it feels like to touch the dog's fur in another place, and the shape, the visual form in a different part of the brain. And that combination of patterns and activation of neurons in different areas of the brain is unique to you. It is unique to you because you're not knowing about dogs. It's unique to you because it's based on your experience of dogs. And it's ex your experience of dog that defines dog for you. And it's my experience of dog that defines dog for me. As long as we pretty much share the same experiences, then the word dog is a rough shorthand for communicating. But what if we don't share the same experience of, of whatever word it is we're talking about? What if we're from the other side of the world from each other? What if we're trying to communicate a concept that's built up for us over years in the English language to somebody who spent most of those years not using the English language, but using a different language? This is fundamental. The sharing of meaning is not an easy thing because it is so individual, so esoteric. We often don't notice, but the problem is always there underlying our profession, underlying the professions of translators and interpreters as well, stories help us to share meanings. Oh, there's a bigger, if you had difficulty seeing the previous slide, um, there's a, a, a bigger representation of one person's, how a dog is represented in the mind of one particular person. So stories bring us together as community, but stories really do allow us to experience another world. And that's of interest not only for the, the language teachers who take a special interest in culture, but for all of us, because culture is embedded in every word of the language that we use and every word that our interlocutors use as well. So this idea of sharing through stories is very important. I'd like you to remember Deepa's words when we listen to another story. We're no longer strangers to them. We're no longer strangers to the world which has provided them with experiences. So I've talked a little about stories and emotion and about stories and the sharing of experience. I'd like now to touch on stories and patterns. I think this is a little less obvious that, that, than some of the earlier points. Um, let me start a little way back from stories. The world is a pretty chaotic place. What's happening around you now is a feast of sensory information that in fact what's happening in the world around you is permanent and total sensory overload and most of it is random there may or may not be some patterns in what's happening to you most of what's happening around you is happening for no particular reason and I'm not talking about big, not just talking about big events, the little events as well, the little things that have happened in the how long 26 minutes since I started to talk to you all of those little things, they're all happening, and they're happening very often for random reasons. That's not the only problem with 
understanding the world through the senses. The second problem is that this is a, a lot of people say that my number is way too big here. I blame Zimmerman and you can look up the reference. I, I, I'll share it with you if you like. But even if he's wrong by an order of magnitude, this is impressive. He's saying that at any given moment, the amount of information around you that is accessible to your senses is about 11 million bits at any given moment. And how much of that can we process at any given moment? 40 bits. From those 40 bits, we have to figure out, I think figure out is going to be an important expression in what I'm going to say here, figure out the rest of it. And when I say we have to figure out the rest of it, I mean the stuff out there that can kill you. It doesn't have to be a lion in the jungle. It could be a car hurtling towards you and you only get to, this, to access this, part, this amount of information at one time. The stuff there that can kill you. On the other hand, the stuff there that can keep you alive. There is food, there is air, there is water to drink. You need to, you need to be able to figure out what's going on in the bits that you really don't have the bandwidth to process through your senses. So basically there are two problems there. One is that for, for any kind of cognition, the world is too busy, too full of information, and most of it seems to be random. The second problem is that you only have access at any given moment to a very small amount of that. How on earth did we survive this long? How did we manage to thrive and populate just about every region of the planet when these are the limitations that our senses put on our ability not only to thrive, but to survive? How indeed? We need to find patterns. We need to find patterns in experience. We need to find patterns that will help us to fill in the gaps between the very small, of it, small amount of information that we can process and the huge amount of information, some of which might kill us or be the best opportunity we've ever had. We need to puzzle things out. We need to put them together into a pattern. If we do manage to put them into a pattern, this putting sensory information into a pattern that makes some kind of sense is so basic to our survival that when we put things together into a pattern that makes sense, we get a reward. For the uninitiated, you are looking at the molecular structure of dopamine. Dopamine is the feel-good chemical. Dopamine is the reward chemical. Dopamine is what gets people addicted to things. I see chocolate, I get a flash of dopamine because I know I'm going to eat it and it's going to make me feel good. Other people work with illicit drugs. Some people get addicted to gambling, all kinds of addiction. Dopamine is at the root of it because it is the brain's reward to itself for doing something good like eating chocolate or like figuring out some pattern from the world around us. If we never figured out patterns, we would never have survived. This is how basic the mechanisms are that we're talking about here. Why are patterns so important? Because the only way we can know what's going to happen next is to find a pattern in what's happened so far. Well, there is no other way. Crystal balls don't work. Even my friend Mr. Spock can't tell us what the future is unless he bases it on patterns that he discovers in what's happened so far. Patterns are fundamental to our ability to face the future. Why is it important to face the future? Well, if we didn't have patterns, if we couldn't make predictions about what was likely to happen yet next, we would do stupid things. The only reason you know that man's going to fall to the ground and injure himself is because you've seen this kind of thing before. You know what happens next. You see the pattern. And this is not just about the big things we do. It's about the very little, the things that we do unconsciously. Like, um, I see this and my body floods me with chemicals that allow me to classically to flee the ball to get ready to fight no that's not going to happen or to freeze in place the adrenaline floods when it sees the ball coming towards me because i have the ability to predict what the ball's going to do to me 
Why do I have that ability? Because I've seen it before. I've seen patterns. I've seen that when the ball looks like that and charges like that, the consequence for the person standing just where the camera is in this picture are not good. OK, we don't meet charging balls every day, but we do often walk past candy shops. What is true for the adrenaline when we see the ball is true for the insulin when we know we're going to be tempted by our favorite candy. Before we put the candy into our digestive system, the insulin is being made because we have patterns that help us to predict. Our whole interaction with the environment is based on spotting patterns, making sense of some of what appears to be random, and making predictions based on those patterns. And in fact, that's what grammar is. Grammar is a framework based on past experiences, which makes us, allows us to make predictions about what word is going to come next, or if we're speaking or writing, what word we can use next. That's what's being tested on this. I think it was from an old TOEIC test of some kind, this one. That's what's being tested here. Are students of English familiar enough with the patterns to make predictions about which of the words A, B, C, or D is going to go in the blank? So it's not just the man in the tree, the charging bull, the candy store. It's what we expect our students to do when they take grammar tests. It's the whole reason for grammar. Grammar exists to limit the cho our choices about the sounds we can make and the characters we can write to make them intelligible. If I could write just anything, then you wouldn't be able to understand what I wrote and language would not help us to, would not allow us to communicate. It's only because we have grammar, a system of patterns which allows us to make predictions about the future, that we can communicate through language. Here's something you may not have considered, or maybe you have. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything? This became a relevant question when a group of neuroscientists were running, the, <laughs> neuro, this is where neuroscientists work. This is a, a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. You may have seen one in the hospital. You may even have been scanned with one at some point, FMRI. The functional bit is because the neuroscientists have their, we're not supposed to call them subjects anymore, are we? They're co-researchers, the man lying down. They, us, they, run tests on them. They have them perform, thing, perform actions like reading, looking at pictures, deciding on things while they're inside the machine. And what happened one day was that after the, all the tests were over, they left the machine on. And the person in there was bored, nothing to think about, nothing to do. And the brain was more active at that point than it had been while the, the co-researcher, the man lying down, had been performing tasks. So what the heck is going on? What's he doing in there? He has absolutely nothing to do. It's a rather noisy white space and his brain's going like crazy. Well, in fact, you knew the answer. As soon as I asked the question, what do you think about when you're not, not thinking about something? You knew that we daydream. We make up stories that link together experiences that we've had. That's daydreaming, or it is when we do it in the daytime anyway. When we do it at night, it's called dreaming. It's the same thing. It's your brain trying out patterns to see if they fit to make sense of some of the experiences you've had during the, the day. The brain is a massive pattern detection system. And that's how we survive. Massive pattern detection system that is constantly on the lookout for something that might be a pattern. It doesn't have to be a pattern. It just has to have the possibility of being a pattern. But during the daytime, usually we're pretty busy doing things. That's why it's at night that we process a lot of those experiences and try to find the patterns. Because the better your understanding of the patterns of the world, the more equipped you are to make good predictions about the world, and the better your chances of not only surviving, but thriving in the world. And again, I'm not talking on a trivial level, I'm talking on a very basic level of individual and species survival. Your brain is trying to put together the pieces of experience so, they, so it can find a pattern. And when it does find a pattern, zap, you get the dopamine. I'm supposed to be talking about stories, and I am. Stories make sense.
Stories are not like experience. Stories come with ready-made patterns already inside them. And if you've heard one love story, you'll know how to know where to look for the patterns in the next love story. They're kind of they're a kind of packaged experience of life. But the packaging is important because it's much simpler to make sense of a story than it is to make sense of the chaos going around you and the rather partial input, partial intake that you're taking from that chaos. Stories make sense. I, this, this is another fun thing. Uh, in the US, they seem to talk, talk, spend time in literature classes talking about story grammar and how the different elements of a story fit together. This is supposed to be a, a, a grammar that will fit any story at all. My wife is addicted to what they call cozy mystery stories. Those are mystery stories where somebody gets killed and they try and figure out who it's done, but you don't see the blood. That's what makes them cozy. There's no blood, there's no visible violence in the books. She loves them. Why does she love them? Because at the end, it all works out. And there are certain rules as well. If you read a mystery story, the, per the, the criminal cannot be someone you've never heard of. It must be somebody who's been mentioned in the story, however peripherally, however incidental. It just breaks the rules of mystery stories if you say, actually, the person who did it was somebody who hasn't figured in this book so far. That cannot happen unless the writer is determined to break the fourth wall and, and do away with all conventions. That's one of the things that makes it so satisfying. It is packaged experience. The package makes it, the packaging makes it more digestible. It makes it safer because you know, even if your story is not cozy, even if it involves a lot of violence, when you come to the end of the mystery story, you're going to know the solution or the resolution to the mystery. You're going to know who did it, how and why, if it's a, a, a crime story, as my wife loves. That's why those crime stories are so addictive for her, because they feed her the dopamine on a plate. It's packaged. Figuring it out, getting the shot of dopamine. There are some people who say that stories go beyond being packaged experience. Some people say that the stories are, in fact, training for training your brain for spotting patterns out in the real world you see the model i've put up on the screen there that's not a model from storytelling that's a model from artificial intelligence how to teach your robot about the world but this is exactly what stories are doing for us as well they're featuring they're they're providing package data that will help us to train our brains to spot the patterns in reality that will help us to get through with life. And then also the, there's a, a testing cycle as well. This is usually when we get to school and the teacher wants to make sure you've understood the pattern of the story, the way the lovers come together, the difficulties they overcome on the way to the happy or sad ending of the story. So this idea that stories package experience and that they make prediction possible because they're based on easily discernible and very well recognized patterns that, that's what a genre is by the way i talked about grammar and language genre in storytelling is a particular pattern this idea that they are there to satisfy us to help us to sensitize us to finding patterns in the real world is very strong and yet another argument for using stories in the classroom. So that was a little excursion into some of the, the brain science that we in the brain sick have been looking at over the past few years, trying to explain the power of stories. And I think the, the explanation itself is very simple. The stories are a powerful way to learn because they tap into, they play into the natural mechanisms that the brain has evolved for learning not for learning language or learning history, just for learning about things. They use the power of emotion to tag certain experiences as being worth remembering. They allow us to share with other people so, so engage the social brain so that we're learning from, with, 
and four other people, or possibly just one of those, but any one of those will trigger the kind of social learning that we know is more powerful than analytic learning. And stories present us with patterns that are satisfying in themselves, that are easily accessible, and that help us to find and learn from the patterns in the language we're studying, in the stories we're reading or hearing, and in our life. So in the end, stories are a preparation for learning from life, which as educators, I'm sure is what we're all trying to do. I, I always think of myself first as an educator and second as a language teacher. If I can help my students to reach some life goal as well as learning English, then I've had a good day. And this, the use of stories in the classroom is a great way for preparing mini adults to live in the adult world. So what should we do? <clears throat> Excuse me. And tell stories, obviously. Um, since I began to understand the power of stories, I've developed some things that, that I do in the classroom. But this is the part where I'd be interested to hear from you about the way you use stories in your teaching or the ways, after hearing what I've had to say, you would like to use stories in your teaching. So this is where, um, Jackie, I would like to throw the floor open to anybody who would like to share a story experience from their classroom or some thoughts about how to use stories um, that have been triggered by this evening's talk. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Would you like uh, people to turn on their mics or in the chat? What would be easiest for you, Stephen? I, I think it would be nice if we could have a live discussion. I'm not, wow, a lot of people are here. Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah. do, 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 do you want to do breakout rooms to share ideas or do you just want to shout out? Mm. What, what works, Jackie? You know your... your um, um, well, I think... Mm. I don't know. It might be nice to have have it in this room so that everybody could hear um, other other people's ideas. Um, but maybe if you want to stop sharing your screen, then we could be in the like big we? gallery view. And then um, if anybody has something they would like to share, um, if that sounds sounds okay. So this is where there's an embarrassed silence and then in the end somebody speaks. So let's let's <laughs> not do the silence, let's just do the somebody stepping forward to share an idea, please. Well, I'll, I'll start <laughs> since my mic's already off. Um, one, one thing that I've done, um, it started as listening practice, but I, um, I just read a story and then have them discuss, restop and have them discuss what happened ask them a few questions, make sure they know, you know, what's going on. So that's just reading, reading a story already, not my own personal story, but they, they love it. And I chose a mystery. <laughs> so there was, you know, anticipation and trying to figure out what's going to happen next and such. So, um, so, so there's, there's mine. <laughs> Thank you. And somebody else had their hand up as well. Uh, Michelle, yeah, if you want to go ahead. Uh Okay, I will just share like one time we had an English camp. So I used the story of three little pigs. So before we had the English camp, I, I uh, actually gave them a preview of the English camp by showing them the nursery rhyme about three little pigs. And I allowed the students to figure out after watching the nursery rhyme uh, animated version what is the story all about? And it was really interesting for, a, for some students to note the word hard work. And the actual English camp revolved around three little pigs. I made activities out of three little pigs and then their creative output is actually to create another story using the lesson from three little pigs. And it was really uh, a wonderful event uh, and I was really happy to see, with the help of other ALTs, different groups were able to make their own um, Three Little Big Story. So one thing that happened is that after two, uh, in, in that two-day English camp, students were even singing the nursery rhyme that I showed them before the English camp. And even after the English camp, they were like so excited to learn about uh, 
to uh, they were saying uh, speaking English all throughout and even after that they'll be speaking to me in English yeah it was a wonderful experience to use stories sounds great Does this mean I haven't convinced you about the value of stories? <laughs> okay, I, I I don't know that this counts as um, telling stories, but maybe it's because I'm a, a lazy teacher. I teach adults, small classes, and basically uh, so much of my lesson is around asking them to tell stories. Mm. Um, and. You know, they, they, it makes a learning environment because I just find that they they are so interested in each other's stories. And of course, in mine, too. But I just think that's a sort of standard thing to have people share stories. And uh, I usually have I'll have them share in pairs and then the, the partner will tell the story. And so it, it gets double mileage. So. That's one thing I've done with adults. Uh, with and when children, you say, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go, go on, go on. But when you say stories, are, are you limiting them to true stories or only to fictional stories or does it not matter? No, I'm basically talking true stories and I've done mm -hmm. it in different ways. Just say, you know, come with something to tell us. And it could be anything. It could be something from their past. They can be sharing things that are going on in their lives. Um, there's a whole variety and it's one way that they create a community because they learn so much about each other by doing that and they're encouraged to ask each other questions after the sharing so you know I, I we dip into the textbook but not so, not so much um, can I share one more with children because I wonder what you think of this because um, of course we've all done the, the um, stories of the famous childhood stories but I love to play with them like you know some people play with um, uh, Cinderella um, who doesn't marry the prince because she's a hip young girl changing the story <laughs> and I had a lovely one where um, we my my colleague and I made a story um, it was about Momotaro so we decided to mix up our cultures a bit so Momotaro goes off um, and on his way, he meets Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and there's a whole feminist thing comes in here. Little Red Riding Hood um, tells him, because this Momotaro is scared of the demons rather than being brave. And so just playing with some of these ideas, um, it's a really fun thing to do. <laughs> in the end, she says, Momotaro, um, I'm not going to make, he says, I love you, Little Red Riding Hood, will you marry me? And um, she says, no, 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 you have to go to a good university and get a good job and then I'll marry you. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> <laughs> a Japanese twist. Okay. Uh, yeah, Stephen, um, Daniel's written in the chat um, as well. Oh. Um, if you want to, it says, I also use reflection and discussion as stories when students reflect and share their experiences, opinions, struggles, emotions, meta analysis, and repetition solidifies content and language, mainly content and understanding. <laughs> He's on the train. <laughs> stories are king. <laughs> so thank you very much, Daniel, for sharing as well. Lovely, lovely. Since I began to look into the, the power of stories, I've really made an effort to integrate stories into just about every course, every lesson that I teach. Um, if I go back to my PowerPoint for a moment. Uh, 
uh, obviously, um, having students write stories is a way of getting stories into the, the writing classroom. Listening to stories, a lot of the listening materials we use are kind of mini stories anyway, but actually going for the, the kind of stories that come with graded readers when they have a, a CD as well, or a, a, a downloadable file that you can use that tells the story for people to listen to. Reading, obviously, I mean, why is extensive reading so phenomenally successful? Why does it give students English such a boost? Part of it surely is simply because most of the extensive reading that we have our students do is story-based. I know there are some non-fiction sort of factual kind of, of readers out there, but a lot of it is story-based. Um, but the most, the greatest success that I've had since I've started rethinking my courses in terms of story has been with the presentation course. And, and this has been the, the most successful thing, I, I, most successful change I've made in my teaching in a very long time. I started the course last year, not by saying, well, we're going to use presentations, so you'd better know PowerPoint and don't forget to make eye contact and a nice loud voice, please. And said, no, I told them a story. And I had them tell me a story. And in fact, I, I, I gave them a course in storytelling, which covered all the general areas that we would in a presentation course, but they were telling stories. And the students' reaction to it was so strong. And they were, tell, they were making presentations by the end that fulfilled the classical requirements of persuasive presentations of appealing both to the emotions and to logic. Because until then, they thought a presentation as a reasoned argument presented with pretty pictures. But when we started with storytelling, and I insisted that every kind of presentation they gave had a story at its core, I found it was a very powerful way of having the students make presentations that had both a heart and a mind in them. So that, for me, has been the, the great change. But I, I encourage you to... It, um, to use the power of stories in whatever course you have. Um, the leader of our brain, Curtis, I think he talked to you uh, a couple of months ago. He, um, I think this for him grew out not only of uh, an interest in, in stories and the power that they have in the brain, but also from the exigencies of, of the lockdown and teaching online and so on. Um, he developed a, a method where he would start every lesson with an inspiring story and end the lesson with a moving story. Now, I'm not sure I inspired you with my story about Dick Allwright at the beginning, but I have a student who I think will move you. Um, she made this presentation online because we were teaching online last year, um, and she allowed me to um, show it to you tonight on the understanding that I would not tell you her name. So this is an anonymous student who has given permission making what I think you will find to be a moving story that we can end this evening's session with. Let me just pull up the file. It was to be what you and I would call an expository, um, an expository presentation, but for her it was to convey some information about the life of a famous painter by telling a story or by telling some stories. If you can't hear the sound, wave your arms and I'll try and fix it for you. But I think you should be able to hear us say hello right now. Hello, everyone. My story is the life of Vincent van Gogh. His name is Vincent van Gogh. Everyone will have heard his name once. Do you know the name of his younger brother? His name is Theodoros Van Gogh. The brothers had been writing letters since the summer of 1872 until July 23rd, 1890, just before Vincent died. Vincent wrote in the letter the worries of his private life. From this, it can be seen that Theo, like a close friend to Vincent. On the other hand, Theo also appreciated his paintings and helped him by providing money. 
Theo was the only supporter of him. Like Vincent, I have had an experience of mental instability. At that time, my only support was my sister. My sister always said, I'm on your side. So, even if it wasn't understood by many people, having my sister understand, it made me happy. So, I was able to understand how important Theo was to Vincent. Vincent died on July 29, 1890. Theo died a year later on January 25th, just like following his brother. Their tombs are still next to each other. These tombs seemed to show the connection of the brothers. Vincent's life has always been with Theo. So I'm sure they will be stay together after they die. Thank you for watching my video. And thank you for joining this evening to um, listen to the presentation. Uh, I, I thought she did a wonderful job. It doesn't have to be a student. Now we have YouTube. There are so many videos out there that we can use to inspire, motivate, and most of all, move. Remember the key of emotion to move our students and to leave the last moments of a lesson, just as I'm about to leave you now, with the words of the student telling the story and the emotions still in your heart. Thank you for listening.